battleship division. We had, I think, three battleships with us, a couple of cruisers probably, and about maybe half a dozen destroyers. It was a uh, drizzly, cold, gray day, approaching in the dark. We made it and uh, dropped anchor, you know, which in itself you were a sitting duck then. But we were old battleships, and I guess they considered us to be expendable to Missouri and Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we just over time. We were given a target around Cherbourg uh, to shell, and uh, the Germans uh, shot back. They were straddling us, and, and we took one shell uh, on top of the conning tower, which the force then was upward, and it damaged or blew out the deck of the navigation grid. I had just left. I missed being a casualty by about 20 minutes, and I was in my bunk down below. I remember we had the lights on, and uh, all the light bulbs just popped. And there was a great deal of dust. Well, then the stretcher bearers came and so on. And um, about it, there were some fires on deck. Then we went back to um, Plymouth, England. Plymouth itself was nothing there but a shipyard. It was really total devastation. There were, you know, blocks that just bombed out. Hmm. I went I went ashore once. I remember seeing that little girl, and she didn't have any hand, but uh, this little girl there, I know her face was dirty. So um, we used to give the workmen there um, Sugar, really appreciate it. For their tea time, precisely at tea time, no matter what, they have their tea, and we used to give them sugar, and they'd appreciate it. I was a tank commander. I was a line sergeant and a platoon leader, which meant two tanks. Had to be uh, six, seven hours, eight hours after Pearl Harbor. We were about, like two of us about. Went on for a good amount of time until they they blew everything up that was there and set it fire. Zeroes came back in and straightened anything that moves. I took King to it upon himself to uh, to surrender. We they apparently had orders not to surrender. And MacArthur had been sending communication, fight to the last man. And uh, Wainwright passed the order on, being a good soldier that he was. And uh, King says that uh, we had a tremendous number of Philippine civilians down there. And they had a hospital full of wounded sick. Well, they were only three miles left from the hospital to where we were. So that, that at the time we surrendered, there was 90% of the people were unfit for, for service. I don't know, I think I was kind of numb. I thought, what the hell? Kind of like, uh, you're a loser no matter what you do. If that's all they're going to feed you, you're going to start, you're going to start death. And you're going to go shoot one another after death. We're fighting over Afghanistan after we we surrendered and we're, we're on the road marching. And it's hot. It's just absolutely torrid. And you sweat. And if you don't have a hat, kept to keep your sun off, it'll bake your brains out. Yeah? And along about the third, third day or so, uh, fourth day, we the guards have been bayoneting people. They've been shooting them. They've been beating them. The trucks have been they push them in front of the trucks. Run over. Uh, uh, so we know that your life isn't worth a tinker's damn as far as they're concerned. We come along and there's an artesian well flowing out there, um, about 20 yards, 30 yards from the road. And I says, uh, life isn't worth living if you can't have a cool drink of water. So I calmly walk to the artesian well. I took my canteen cup, I drink of water, and I think I filled my canteen. I filled my canteen cup and I turned and I started walking. And as I'm walking back, other men from the line come running, running out. And as soon as they started running, they were shot. And there kept to be a crowd. I looked back once and there was a whole bunch of them. And I could hear the bullets whizzing by. And I think I walked within four foot of a jet guard with a rifle. Didn't look at him. I looked at the ground and I just kept walking. And he didn't shoot me. When I got back in line and I caught up with him, Here, have a drink of water. And they said, You drink it. You risked your life for it. You drink it. Damn your pour the water in the ground. Mm -hmm. I was so taken back. Further on the line, we got to San Fernando. And we're put in a, a barbed wire enclosure in which is a, a cock fighting pit. Stands, grandstands, bleachers. And the Filipinos are bringing food wrapped in banana leaves and sugar cakes, boil off of their sugar cane, and various things like this. And they're bringing them to 
interest rate, and the Japanese are taking it and putting it in a marriage bank. And the second or the third day, Sid Sign says, Fellas, I'm going to go have lunch. He says, the Filipinos have been bringing food to us the last two days, and the Nips are keeping it. They've got it in their barracks bag. He says, I'm going to go get the barracks bag. And anyone that helps can have a piece of the barracks bag. And if you don't help, no food. So we just said, well, what's the plan? Sign says, I'll go in and get the bag. <clears throat> Strucker, you come halfway in with me. I'll turn and I'll throw you the bag. And if the, jack, if the guards jump me, he says, I'll be free to fight. You take off with the bag. And then you go by the water spigot. The water spigot is 15 feet from the gate, and there is a mob of people around him all the time, day and night. But it trickles so slowly, it takes that long to everybody to get it somewhere. So, <coughs> Van is given the job to go and start a fight at the water fountain, cause a distraction. And Sign says, Paul, I know you played some football. You hang back by the gate, and when the first guard comes through, you throw a block into him. I said, all right, I can do that. Sign goes in, he gets the bag, he throws it to Struck, and Struck runs out with it, Sign comes running out. Two nips come around. The first nip goes around, he's tearing his rifle by the barrel, uh, and he's hollering and screaming and full tilt, and he come out the gate, and I hit him at the knees, and he flew in the air, and he flew into this mob of the water spigot, where Viet is starting to fight. And I look up, and here comes the second guy. Oh, yeah. And so uh, when he comes over, I tripped him. And he flew head first. And then I got up. I look at the two of them, and they're starting to get up. So I say, no, you don't. And I jump up. Then I grab Americans, and I throw the Americans. I keep passing. Funny Americans. Then I reach in, and I pull the rifle out. And I says, that sucker going to start shooting me. He can hurt He can hurt somebody. So I pull the rifle out. Both rifles. And then I look down the line, and I see Simon and struck it up put down the brass bag and they had stuff in their shirts. And when they straightened up and everybody else dove into that thing, I hollered that bed and I said, it's all done, quick, run. And the two of us went to pre-assigned place. And we met the, the other two and divided up the, the spoils of our, of our raid. And everybody's on their own. You get caught eating it, you're on your own, and nobody helped you get it, and, and it's your baby. So go and be careful. So I went and found my friend Jim McComas, who was having a malaria attack, and he's laying in the dirt alongside the bob wire fence. Jim, I have something for you. He said, what is it? I said, it's sugar cane. He said, I don't want it. I said, I don't care. You're going to take it. No, he said, take it. You stole it, you eat it. He says, I've got a lot of fat to live on. I says, You've got nothing to live on except a sugar cake. And I said, I'm going to stuff this sugar cake in your mouth if you don't take it. Then I'm going to holler for a Jack Guard and say, look, he stole a sugar cake. And Jim says, you son of a bitch, put the sugar cake in his hand.